everyone. Thank you for joining the Injective Hacks on Demo Day. Appreciate for the patience. Chris will take over and start it. Hey, hello. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh. All right. Awesome. Cool. All right. Yes. Thanks so much for um, uh, tuning into this um, Injective Hackathon demo day. Um, I'm Chris. I look after the products here at Injective Labs. And um, we're so proud um, to see all the projects here. And it's very happy um, to see what has um, come through. Um, but let's um, go through the the overview, like the like some numbers of uh, this hackathon, right? So all in all, we have um, 357 registered hackers and more than 300 projects submitted, right? Obviously we've done a lot of filtering in the end, but yeah, but all in all, it was 300 projects submitted, um, more than hundred hours of mentorship hours. Um, and uh, we had 52 industry experts um, coming from our, uh, our ecosystem and also like um, uh, esteemed partners, right? And, and also, well, yeah, for, uh, more than 40 external partners as well, as mentioned here. Um, and these partners including uh, in, include like the following, right? So uh, like uh, including wormhole pith, so it's like very uh, much uh, uh, like useful to the builders um, in our space, but um, obviously with, with Notify, Eclipse and Frontrunner um, uh, as well, like helping us, um, uh, helping us, like, like mentoring and also like um, talking to our um, hackers, right? And of course, right, um, we needed the, the judges and speakers, right? So um, I would like to just um, uh, just uh, put a record and say thanks to um, all, all 12 of these um, amazing judges and, and speakers, right? So um, Altcoin Psycho, Danku, Kev, Mark, Neil, Nikhil, Nimish, Saeed, Sebastian, Stefan, Will, and Saki. Um, all right, and um, just a quick um, uh, uh, overview of like what actually, um, what, what did we, um, or, or more like what, what did our hackers um, uh, enjoy um, throughout these um, four weeks, right? So there were eight panel sessions, right? So um, with Wormhole, you know, Notify and Frontrunner, Nobo Sommelier, Astroport, um, Eclipse, Solana team, Celestia, um, KuCoin venture, Kraken venture on um, on the VC side of things, and Kepler Leap and DeFi X DeFi wallet, as well as Dora Hacks, right? And from the um, Injective Labs team, like we also gave out a lot of technical workshops as well, right? So um, talking uh, ranging all the way from like introduction on uh, of DeFi, like why build on Injective. How to use Cosmosm, right? And um, like how to use our like uh, the full stack of um, injective stuff, um, as well as like how to um, launch a actual product on injective and some tips on that. And I believe that um, the feedback that we got from uh, the hackers were that like they found all of these panel sessions and workshops extremely extremely um, useful and helpful. All right, so um, before we um, before we get started with the the demo stuff, right? Just I just wanted to use this opportunity to talk about some of the um, the recent developments um, that have uh, we have em uh, empowered the builders, right? So um, uh, like so we 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 have announced like a a new DAP um, uh, building on top of us called Apollo, right? Um, we have. Um, uh, infrastructure partnership with um, Tencent Cloud. So I believe a lot of our um, uh, hackathon participants will be able to use um, like the Tencent, like free credits on Tencent or or some support from Tencent. I think that's, that's awesome. Um, we also have a new um, uh, a side chain uh, called Cascade and currently is in the testnet phase, but we're extremely, extremely excited about this because um, it can support SVM um, uh, environments for uh, injective. Uh, and last but not least, and I think like this is um, very relevant to a lot of us here, um, would be the um, 
the, the 150 million venture group uh, of injective, right? So um, uh, obviously, like you, 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 we're talking about like really, really prestigious um, um, investors here, right? Such as Pantera, Jump, IDG, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, um, th these people are like all willing to listen to um, uh, like organic builders from um, Injective and see like how can they help and grow uh, together, right? And in terms of the, um, yeah, some also some uh, news on the integration side, it's um, uh, we just announced like a new integration with um, Swap, right? Uh, uh, as a cross-chain um, swap uh, protocol, right? And then there's also Pith for um, a lot of the Oracle stuff and um, glad to see actually a lot of the um, well, the new builders and existing builders alike are already like really, really using um, the Pith stuff. Um, also Notify um, is bringing in uh, a unique uh, solution for, uh, for injective users. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, the Kraken integration, right? So um, I, I believe like you will see, like all of us, we will we'll see more and more of the centralized exchanges um, uh, integrating with the injective mainnet. And that's great for um, user onboarding and uh, for for injective. Okay, and a little bit of um, uh, advertising the upcoming events, right? So um, we have uh, we have oh <laughs> Project X coming up, right? So Project X is um, well. I don't want to give away too much, but yeah, it's uh, we're, we're, it's something that we're building that the team has been building, but also like um, the community has also been um, like participating as well, right? So we're all very um, excited to to see this um, going live, right? And um, and also there's the Awesome Wasm conference coming up, um, uh, as well as the the Delphi cost, uh, the Delphi hackathon, which is happening as we speak. And um, and yeah, like we 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 had a we had a sneak peek at the um well not sneak peek but we, we looked at the hackathon projects as well as um um like projects outside of this hackathon that are currently like we know are building on Injective um right now and we're super super excited about this right so um like all all major verticals are covered right so lending NFT fi. Um, options protocol, um, AI stuff, more DEXs, and also real world um, assets, RWA, right? So uh, we can, we, we, we're seeing a, a lot of these different verticals, right? And this enhances um, Injective's um, core ability as being the blockchain built for DeFi, right? And, and, we, can, uh, and we really look forward to all of these um, verticals have really, really vibrant um, applications and um, awesome developers. Um, and yeah, like without further ado, it's showtime. Um, back to you, Vivian. Thank you for the closing talk. Let's get it started for the first demo project. Awesome. Yeah, it's a... It's a pleasure. This is uh, Philip Forte here. Let me get the presentation pulled up. One sec. While Philip's doing that, I guess I'll just say hi and run through a quick background. Um, my name is Cole. Been working in the space since 2016. Um, I was the president of the blockchain club at UC Irvine, uh, where I went to school for two years. Um, wrote the first DeFi focused newsletter on Forbes in 2019. Uh, when DeFi started taking off in 2020, I dropped out, went all in on crypto, um, invested in some funds like Three Rose Capital, started gaining a lot of uh, angel deal flow, mostly focused on the investing side um, for a couple of years until, uh, until I joined Elixir full time about a year ago. Awesome. Are you guys able to see my screen, by the way? Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, guys, it's a pleasure to, uh, you know, to have the chance to speak with all of you today. Um, real high level. So my name is Philip Forte. I'm one of the founders here at Elixir. Um, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll start with just a high level of, of my background and dive into the high level of Elixir and our integration with um, Injective. And um, so, yeah, without further ado, um, kind of on my background. So, yeah, I also got into crypto back in 2016 when I started the Carnegie Mellon blockchain group. I was the president there until I graduated from CMU. I then ran a company called Block Venture for a little over three years, up until around roughly a year and a half, two years ago, when I saw the opportunity for Elixir and um, decided to, to press pause on Block Venture to go all in. Um, real high level, um, so just getting into the actual presentation. Um, so something that we saw at Block Venture, right? Um, we were coming across like four or five blockchain startups a day. And um, everyone needed kind of a centralized market maker for their for their centralized exchange pairs. And so because those are pretty much the only options that were available. So they had to go through one of the big five names, right, which at the time was like GSR, Jump, Alameda, Amber, Wintermute. And um, although these guys, you know, they're super smart, um, they run you know great firms. Generally, they're, they charge anywhere from like two to four plus percent of the total token supply for a 12 month market making contract. Um, and especially if you're like a smaller project, a lot of those top firms, um, which obviously do great work, um, but, you know, they don't, you know, touch a lot of the projects that are not kind of in the top, you know, the really top tier. Um, and then the ones that do, right, like you kind of just have to bite the bullet and, and pay this amount. Um, and, you know, at the same time, there's other things like you have no idea if these centralized firms are doing what they're saying they're doing. Um, you know, you don't actually um, kind of have aligned incentives, right, and um, in that like, a lot of these centralized firms are less incentivized to actually um, hold the tokens that, that they're being paid. Um, and so we also saw this um, on the DeFi side as well. And so kind of like when talking to a lot of these different leading central limit order books and concentrated liquidity AMMs, something that we noticed was that um, they were all kind of courting, courting the same four or five names for liquidity on their books. And so, um, you know, what we saw was that a lot of these did, a lot of these big, you know, big players in the DeFi space were actually being held back by the fact that um, market making only has essentially a handful of centralized names. We got a lot closer with these market makers actually back in um, at Block Venture because we were the number one referrer of projects to GSR. So we were sending them like hundreds of projects a year. The um, consistent feedback obviously we're getting from projects is like, look, this is like, you know, super expensive. Like what is the alternative? There really is none. Um, but um, as we got closer with these market makers, we realized that market making in crypto is actually fundamentally different from market making in traditional finance. So in crypto, um, the profit center is actually different, right? Um, when you think about market making in traditional finance, you probably think about um, you know huge skyscrapers, you know, with like a thousand U Chicago PhDs, sub second latency, um, near zero execution time, right? And that's because the profit center for market making in traditional finance is derived from open market performance. So what you make in the open market is what you take home. In crypto, generally, we got a lot closer with these names and realized that they're all running very simple delta neutral provisioning scripts, um, essentially very simple scripts to build up liquidity on the order books. And when, when I talked to them about it, they were like, look, I mean, generally, we're a probably break even on the actual provisioning of liquidity where we make our money is actually uh, charging these projects and exchanges access to this market making. And so I went to Cole and I was like, look, there really is no reason that a de decentralized algorithmic alternative couldn't exist to do the same thing. And so that was the inspiration behind Elixir. So real high level. So Elixir is building the industry's decentralized algorithmic market making protocol for centralized and decentralized exchanges. So when supply liquidity, the protocol will algorithmically build and deploy that liquidity on the order books in a delta neutral fashion, building up the order books, tightening up the bid ask spread and deepening liquidity on those pairs. So it's very similar to Uniswap V2, right? So Uniswap V2 has their X times Y is equal to K curves. Um, we actually use what is uh, regarded as kind of the X times Y is equal to K equivalent for order books. Um, it's called a Velanita. It's what a lot of the big players use to deploy liquidity on the order books in a delta neutral fashion. Um, also similar to the way that Uniswap has LP tokens, our protocol also has LP tokens. And that actually allows for projects to incentivize outside liquidity to their centralized exchange pairs, for example. But even bigger than on the centralized exchange side of things is actually um, uh, on the decentralized exchange side. So um, because Elixir is a fully decentralized protocol, we can actually be natively integrated into DEXs 
to where we can actually allow for these DEXs to unlock the retail liquidity for algorithmic market making on their exchange. So we have actually over 20 DEXs that are integrating us into the front end of their, of their exchange. Um, and, um, you know, with Injective, you know, we're, we're excited to kick off a process to where we're, we're able to enter the ecosystem, and hopefully allow for um, anyone to be able to supply liquidity to markets on Injective um, and supply liquidity to order book pairs on Injective the same way that they could supply liquidity to an AMM pair, for example, on Uniswap. And so, um, yeah, just going through, I mean, these points, yeah, I mean, we, we kind of mentioned on the, um, you know, a Velanita uh, algorithm that we essentially use. Um, we have some, uh, a great breakdown of it. It's very simple. It's kind of the industry standard. Um, you can think about it as, as Uniswap's X times Y is equal to K curves. Um, and we essentially allow for anyone to supply liquidity to, to pairs, um, as opposed to like kind of a handful of big firms only. Um, and so in this regard, Elixir is essentially, Elixir is essentially, you can, you can almost think of us as decentralized infrastructure enabling projects and exchanges to bootstrap liquidity to their books, right? And that doesn't exist today. And so we see that, we see ourselves filling that role just across the space. Um, so I know I kind of already touched on a lot of these points, but um, yeah, the, uh, essentially the, the main goal of this inter integration, um, you know, we're aware that, that Injective has a DMM reward program. It's been great at getting liquidity on the books. Um, Injective runs obviously a, a great shop and, and we're huge fans of what, what they're building. Um, but what we think we can do is actually um, expand the, the capital efficiency of the rewards that are already being paid out, right? Because when you look at the liquidity on the order books, it's essentially, a, it's a two variant, it's a two variant equation. Like there's two different kind of sides. There's the amount of rewards that you're actually paying out as a protocol, right? Um, and Injective and all of the protocol holders bear that, right? Um, but there's actually also the capital efficiency per dollar that is being paid out in INJ token rewards, right? And so for us, what we wanna be able to do is allow for anyone to supply liquidity to these pairs and allow for, while you know, Injective can pay the same amount out in DMM rewards, now um, anyone can essentially supply liquidity and earn these, uh, earn these rewards, right? So kind of going into the next slide, typical APYs for DMMs on Injective range between 50 to 200%. Um, you can actually check this out um, at the dmm.injective.network. But um, what we essentially are, are targeting with us, right, is that if people are able to actually um, choose a pair and supply to it and earn a share of these DMM rewards, uh, we're essentially able to free this market for these APYs to where essentially um, anyone can earn a share of these rewards. And so, I mean, imagine for like some of the people on the call, like, um, if you could supply like USDC and USDT to a stable to stable pair on Injective and earn like 150% APY, like that's something that's pretty compelling and to date hasn't been possible. Um, and so that's kind of where we see ourselves coming in. And via this integration, we anticipate um, uh, that we're able to significantly increase the uh, liquidity profile of Injective. And that's what we're targeting. Um, and so moving to our architecture. So this is already live. Um, we uh, we're in our testnet v2, um, which is what the demo I'll be uh, kind of running through later in, in this uh, presentation at the tail end here. But the real high level of our protocol, um, we have an off chain DPoS network that is um, currently live. Um, it's not in mainnet. We're in a testnet v2, like I'd mentioned, but essentially it's very similar to Arbitrum security model in that um, we essentially have this off chain protocol. And then if a validator acts maliciously, there's an on chain fraud proof that is posted on Ethereum mainnet. Um, and then that that validator essentially gets gets jailed, they drop out of the validator set. Um, and uh, they essentially would get slashed on chain. Um, and so our protocol updates orders once a second, you can see kind of the high level here, um, where the left side is the off chain components, the right side is the on chain kind of components. And so uh, right now, Nearly all of this is live. The only last thing that we need to essentially adopt is um, in our testnet v3, we'll have on-chain fraud proofs. Um, that, and that, so that actual slashing is the only thing that still needs to go live, but you can actually get um, testnet Elixir tokens. You can actually stake them towards your validator or delegate them towards another validator and actually participate in that consensus um, and, and uh, make markets across multiple pairs, um, across multiple exchanges. And so, just in the interest of time, I won't dive in here, but happy to answer any questions from people who have specific questions um, on our architecture. So yeah, like I mentioned, we're testnet v2 um, is live already. We have um, 
I, yeah, th this is <laughs> this is like right when it went live. So you can see there's 24 validators live. We actually have over 13,000 validators that are live. Um, so if you go to uh, dashboard.elixir.finance, you can you can actually go and check it out. Spin up a validator yourself. Um, we actually have our docs, which are going to be linked at the tail end of this presentation. Um, it's also docs.elixir.finance. You can check that out. Um, and then um, you can actually see the metrics page there and us and where we're quoting on markets, right? You can see our bid and our ask versus the top of book for these pairs, right? And, and um, essentially all of our validators, every bid and ask that is um, like every bid and offer essentially that is making their way to exchanges, our protocol is coming to consensus for. Um, and so you can actually see us in action. Um, some stats on the actual, um, on our actual protocol by the numbers. So we've done one over one billion in volume um, to date. Um, we have, uh, yeah, like some pretty cool metrics here. Yeah, the, the 4,500 validators is, is out of date as well. We have a little over 13,000. Um, we have um, over 88,000 unique Elixir token holder addresses. Um, so you can go check that out on Kareli. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of people actually stake those into the staking contract, but you can actually, um, we have the full analytics, which we're, we're happy to share as well on that. Um, and then um, much of that is staked, which you can see in the bottom right. Um, and, uh, you know, we were, uh, we did quite a bit of Gurley's uh, testnet transactions um, the first two weeks that we actually went live. The first week was roughly at yeah, 10.4%. The next week was roughly 9% of Ethereum testnet transactions. So um, that's kind of on that side. On the traction, we have um, over 60 protocols that have committed to using us for market making on their centralized exchange pairs. Um, and then what is kind of most applicable for this is actually our, our native integrations that we have lined up. Um, Injective is actually our first integration. And so, you know, we love the Injective team. Um, you know, we've been to their office. They're, they run a great shop. Um, and uh, their tech is like quite nice <laughs> to, to build on. So um, kind of shameless plug for Injective there. But um, they're, they're going to be the first kind of, uh, you know, in integration partner. Um, followed by um, a couple of these other names like DYDX, Vertex, uh, Magpie, Drift, um, your Perk Protocol, Trader Joe, right? A lot of these, um, uh, there's a couple names here like Pancake Swap that we plan on going live with as well to where within the actual interface will allow for users, you know, to press a button and supply liquidity to markets or for these concentrated liquidity AMMs, they can supply, you know, press a button to supply liquidity normally like they do right now, right? Or they can press a button to supply liquidity via Elixir um, you know, within the interface and earn plus 10% APY paid out in the, uh, it, you know, in, in, token, in, in the native token reward um, from the exchange. And so here's the team. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, just in the interest of time, I won't run through everyone. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm Philip. Um, Chris is our CTO. Um, he's, he's been amazing. He is actually the, the creator of the Slow Loris attack, which is uh, pretty interesting. I definitely check out the Wikipedia page on that. Um, and then Cole, um, he is uh, Cole0x on Twitter. Um, he's our head of operations and he's been, um, yeah, like huge value add, um, obviously like the backbone of our BD operation. Um, and then we have a pretty seller um, like team, uh, development slash engineering team, which is like listed down below, but um, everyone has been, has been huge. Um, you know, Manuel came from Hummingbot, um, actually de developed their market making strategies there. Um, and then um, Oliver, who's our full-time quantitative developer, um, was previously at DRW, um, and before that was at uh, University of Waterloo doing computer science. So, so here's some of our backers. We actually just closed um, our, our Series A, where we raised 10 million. Um, you can check out our our investors here. But um, yeah, we're uh, you know we're we're super excited to be working with some some good names. Um, so yeah, that's like the real high level, um, you know, of Elixir. I think um, kind of I'll run through this quick video demo and then, um, you know, I'll open it up to questions and I, I'm happy to kind of pull back up the deck and answer kind of anything that uh, dive into the tech or whatever, you know, you guys would kind of like. So, um, yeah, I'll stop my I'll stop sharing my screen and then I'll move over to the uh, to this demo and pull that up real quick. Should have it already up. Second. For the demo. <laughs> All right. All right. Sweet. So I'll try to full screen this so you guys can see. Um, hopefully this works. Are you guys able to see? I just tried full screen in it. All right. Here we 
good. You're good. Okay, sweet. So there's no sound. So I'll just kind of like walk through. There's also, um, so here's our VPS instance. Um, there's also titles. Um, so we pulled this together for the objective hackathon. So we're SSHing into the uh, VPS that we have set up. Super low um, hardware requirements, by the way. Um, but we essentially are pulling the latest Elixir Docker file. So what we're actually demoing here is the testnet v2. Um, and this is going to be something that anyone can actually do to um, validate orders actually on injective. So um, editing the Docker file. So yeah, we're essentially all we're doing is we're this we're, we pulled this Docker file. We're grabbing this this um, testnet girly account information and, and putting it into the um, actual Docker file for this validator. Um, you'll see here um, we grab the private key. Um, there's, there's obviously, this is a burner wallet. So like, I'm fine with leaking it. <laughs> um, we drop it into the actual Docker file. Um, so it's important to set one up. Obviously that's new. Um, you don't want actual funds in these, in this uh, wallet, adding the uh, validator name, um, and then writing it out. Right. So now we've edited that Docker file, um, in the terminal. So now what we do is we actually build the image based on this Docker file. And so you can see we um, are just building it. We made this super simple for anyone to spend. All you're essentially doing is pulling a Docker file, you edit it, um, and then you actually go straight into um, into building essentially this, this Docker container um, and this validator. So we've built the actual validator image. Now we're actually launching the consensus protocol after we've built the image. So you can see that we're connecting to a lot of the different web sockets across these exchanges. Um, if you look at the actual URLs, we've connected to Gate, Binance, and KuCoin, which are the three first exchanges that our protocol is connected to. Um, so now it's launching the actual strategy executor, right? And so you can see that we're actually starting to compute the actual orders. So you can see that we're actually computing um, and we're actually market making for INJ to USDT, um, which I just highlighted there um, on KuCoin right now. And so, um, and so you can actually see here, you can connect the wallet, and so now in order to actually get our validator, so our validator is running now, but we needed to actually participate in consensus. So what we're doing is we claim the, uh, the testnet ELXR tokens from our faucet. So this is, this is on, um, you know, a testnet version of Ethereum, obviously. So you can see that here um, in the middle of the screen, you see your in stake balance is now a thousand ELXR, right? And so now what we do is you can see that we've claimed it. Now we're going to stake it. So we're going to stake, I believe I put in a thousand. Yeah, I think I did the full amount. So yeah, we stake the full amount of Elixir. We approve it. And now we're actually staking the Elixir. You could see the girly ETH. This is when girly ETH was crazy expensive. It's a lot, it's a lot better now. Um, it was partly due to, to partly due to Elixir too, but all right, you can, so now, um, now that we've staked the actual balance, now we need to actually enroll. So you can actually see, we've connected obviously that, um, that same wallet that we've inputted into the Docker file. Um, and now we enroll as a validator. And so that's what we're doing now. And so boom, we're done. So you can see we're enrolled. We've staked a thousand ELXR, and now we can actually go to the leaderboard and we can check our to see that we're there. And so we input our our address. You can see we've staked a thousand ELXR. We're participating in consensus from the fifth of of May. So now we got to go back up. So we go to metrics, and you can actually see us placing bids and asks for INJ to USDT on KuCoin. So all of these orders that we're quoting, we have all of these validators that are actually coming to consensus for each of these orders. And so you can see here, we've also supporting, we're also making markets across finance, right? So we're able to actually support multiple pairs across these different exchanges, which is actually something that like, um, we were able to add kind of as functionality in our V2 iteration um, of our test net. And so that's pretty much the full, the full demo. There's a link to the docs, testnet v2, 
Um, feel free to reach out, Philip at elixir.finance. Um, let me see here, but yeah, I'll pull up in the deck and I'm happy to dive through specific questions and, you know, I'll kind of open it up to Q and A because I think I'm a little bit over time. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to keep it to 10 minutes, but um, I'll uh, share my screen once more and yeah, happy to dive into specific questions. So one second, go back over here. All right, so we'll probably just full screen it again. All right, cool. Well, yeah, happy to open it up to uh, any questions if anyone has anything. Yeah, I'm typing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I have a question. It's Albert. Um, yeah, what, what kind of consensus do you use? Is it Tendermint? And um, how does it connect with, I guess, Ethereum? Since I saw you enroll on a smart contract on mm -hmm. you know, Curly. Yeah, how does how does that how does yeah. that, 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 that work? Yeah, yeah. You know? So no, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll pull up in the architecture slide. So real high level, we have our own DPoS network. We're actually not using Tendermint. Um, we we it's very similar um, in kind of security to um, we have a very similar security layout as like Arbitrum's security model, right? And so the way that you can think about our our validators, right? Um, it's it's very similar in that. So the relay infrastructure, which you'll see here, actually requires a 66.67% sign-off from the validators. So the actual like, kind of order flow, the validators pull the data from the exchanges, right? Um, we connect into these different um, exchanges via APIs and web sockets. So we actually pull those feeds and then we, our validators actually each compute the bids and asks for each of the orders across these exchanges. And then they sign the order proposal and then um, each of those order proposals, essentially, if, if it has that required 66.67% um, sign off, then the relay will essentially sign the orders. So the relay infrastructure is essentially um, long term, it'll be MPC infrastructure. Uh, we're actually been working very closely with um, some of the leading MPC guys, obviously, to build that out. Um, but essentially, right now, what it is, is it's uh, Intel SGX plus Shamir secret sharing at the actual uh, relay infrastructure, which holds the keys. Um, those Essentially, if there is, um, if it require, if, if it achieves the threshold of sixty six point six seven percent of sign offs or the con kind of consensus at the validators, um, it signs the orders and sends that off to the exchanges. Um, the way that the fraud proof mechanism works, so say that like, so say that there's a thousand validators, right, um, and say that the top one hundred participate in consensus. If one of those one hundred says something different and 99 say they all agree on an order proposal and one says something malicious or different, what, what would happen is that order proposal gets sent to the relay, right? Um, the relay, it, it has that required 66.67% sign off, right? So it gets signed and sent to the exchange. That one validator that said that thing that was different would actually become jailed. Um, and so they actually fall out of the validating set, right? So the top 100 essentially by total ELXR stake um, is uh, actually active in consensus. They get jailed, they fall out of the validator set. One of the other 1,000 validators gets subbed in, right? And then there's an on-chain fraud proof that is posted on-chain to actually splash that one validator. And so, yeah, we're not actually using Tendermint for this. This is, um, you know, we have a very, it's kind of like a optimistic um, consensus mechanism that is modeled off of uh, Arbitrum's security model, if that makes sense. Um, the last thing I guess I'll mention, you, you mentioned, um, kind of how does how do you tie in um, on ethereum like the on-chain component so our protocol is plugged in to these exchanges uh yeah via but via web sockets the way that our integration would actually look um is that so say that like um on in an in injective a user presses a button to supply liquidity to a pair right on the back end their their funds would actually go to a smart contract on the injective protocol um, that is like, obviously, yeah, fully non-custodial. You can deposit, withdraw at any time. Um, you know, we have actually a trail of bits who's going to be auditing that. Um, and so they essentially, um, yeah, they, they, on the back end, that smart contract is actually connected to the Elixir protocol. Um, and so any orders are actually signed via that, via that smart contract. And then the orders are actually um, updated on an ongoing basis. And we're actually pulling the order book, the state of the order book via WebSocket. So, um, and then, yeah, the, like the on-chain component, that's like, you can see here on the controller aspect on the right, 
Um, that's what actually handles um, staking and slashing and staking towards validators. That's all on Ethereum mainnet. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But um, yeah, let me know if it doesn't. Yeah. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the way this works then is um, in order to actually execute orders, let's say on injective, you only need the signature from one validator. Um, and, and it's just that, you know, if the validator chooses to, let's say, sell tokens at a extremely bad price um, and let's say to take advantage of that, then um, you just rely on some fraud, fraud proof mechanism for other validators to observe that and submit it to Elixir and then I guess slash that validator, right? Is that correct? Or oh, do you yeah. actually have some? Yeah. No, that bad order would never make its way to the exchange. And the reason for that is that we have that required throughput actually at the infrastructure, the relay infrastructure level. So say that like, Say that like one, like, yeah, kind of like think about that example I gave, right? Where one one validator says something like malicious. Like we actually, for all of these validators are each running every pair on every exchange, right? I mean, it's very simple and easy to scale up because um, I mean, in long-term, these guys are actually, these validators are gonna be running SGX enclaves to where they'll actually randomly introduce some entropy into the actual, um, the, the actual outputs. Um, but like just for simplicity's sake, you can just assume that so each of these validators is computing every order on every exchange for every pair on every exchange, right? I mean, it scales up in, in O O linear time, right? So it's because it's just simple multiplication, right? Like, um, so um, even if we were mar making markets on every pair on every exchange, right? Um, you could still run that on pretty basic infrastructure. And so, yeah, every validator is actually computing. Um, they pull that, that, that data feed. They each compute the orders. They come to consensus. Right. Um, so one, if one validator says something different, they're not able to actually make that. Um, so yeah, they, they're not actually going to able to get that to the uh, <laughs> like to the exchange, if that makes sense. But yeah, essentially, what would happen though is that yeah, they would get slashed though if they propose something wrong, and um, you know, like set whatever. If you wanted to try to overtake the actual uh, like and actually get one bad order. Um, to the exchange, you would essentially need to have um, like it, it, you couldn't do it with one validator, right? You'd have to have like a large. Sure. So large I, I guess with one relay node, you could do it then, right? Like no, so then... the relay node is actually um, decentralized infrastructure. Um, so yeah, the actual relay is decentralized MPC infrastructure um, because yeah, if you think about it, right? It's like if your keys are broken up and um, like with MPC, um, I mean, you know, like high level of MPC, but for, for anyone who's listening, MPC essentially just breaks up the keys and stores it like cryptographically so that you don't really, like you don't need like a hot wallet and a cold wallet for exchanges, for example, you can essentially have this, that you can like generate keys within this MPC infrastructure. But anyways, yeah, so we, that's actually just infrastructure. Um, like, and so you'd just be leaning on that cryptographic um, MPC infra. Yeah, but you're not having like 4,500 people part of this MP MPC, right? It's more like, let's say five. And yeah. you know, well, the community is corrupt, then you can, you know, export. Well, imagine, right? imagine that like, imagine that essentially, imagine we have one, like imagine we have this solution with Fireblocks, right? And it, this is essentially our relay node infrastructure. So right now, I mean, the reason why it's relay nodes is we have SGX plus Shamir secret sharing, which is the same tech as the AVAX ETH bridge. Um, but like long term, we actually envision this as like decentralized MPC infrastructure. So imagine that we have this MPC infrastructure, like a credo. Like I don't know if you've heard of it, like credo network, but like essentially the keys are all that's stored in in the actual relay infrastructure. So that's not something that like the validators themselves don't have access to the keys. Um, they essentially just send the cryptographically signed right because each of these validators can sign an order. Um, and then if it has the required number of, of signed orders, it essentially will get sent to the relay infrastructure, which when sign the, uh, if it has that, that cryptographic, you know, number of signatures, it actually will sign those orders within the relay infrastructure with the keys. Um, and then essentially then, because you essentially need the keys to sign a valid order, right? Like on injective, right? Obviously for like, you need a private key. Um, it's the same thing with like any key kind of like any like for any of this, right? And long term, we actually envision that anyone will be able to link their individual exchange account um, to the Elixir protocol. Um, and this is a lot longer term, but um, in kind of like the fully permissionless decentralized version of this protocol, right? Is that anyone can, can, can like, they can essentially connect their API um, and link their individual exchange accounts to the Elixir protocol. Essentially, they would be trusting this decentralized MPC infrastructure via like Credo or one of these other big 
um, you know, players that we would essentially be working with. Um, and yeah, and so that's, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I would look on that side. The relay, the relay node is just essentially going to be like holding the keys and there's, it's, they're, they're only running, like you can actually make it so that it's like cryptographically, they don't even have access to the actual, like, yeah, none of the, any, not, like the relay is not going to have access to the actual underlying keys, if that makes sense. I, I, I guess I there's one issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a I have a question about the relay node setup because if you're going through like a SSS and also MVC setup, uh, essentially you're going to have issues with like key rotation, um, unless you know you have some sort of contract to uh, delegate that task on like you know rotating between different types of uh, shards. So wondering how you have it set up and like you know what's your plan strategy around implementing SGX and you know how does it play a role into the strategy? Yeah, so. Just to like reiterate, the relay infrastructure itself is just for for storing keys in a in a like secure fashion, right? And so, like that's something that it like has been that's like what MPC is kind of like known for, right? Um, I think the actual like specifics right now, what we have is this SGX plus Shamir secret sharing kind of setup, which is I know I, I already mentioned it's like the AVAX ETH bridge. Um, the specifics of how the MPC infrastructure is set up. I mean, I would definitely need to tie in my my CTO to see like the specifics of what he has like in mind for that. But I mean, this is something that like all we need to do is store keys there and in a cryptographically secure manner and release essentially have those keys like sign orders when they receive a validator, uh, essentially a valid proposal from the validators. And so that's like something that is pretty pretty easy to do. Um, and that's something very similar to like, like any of these other MPC infrastructure providers. That's like, I mean, all they do is store keys. Um, and at, like, and you can cryptographically actually kind of have those sign orders. Um, when there's a, like a cryptographically, because like, imagine if like, when you have a, an order proposal, and then each of these validators sign that proposal, it's easy to cryptographic, you can actually just check cryptographically that it has that required number of signatures, right. And so yeah, I don't know if that like kind of answers your question. I know that was like <laughs> kind of the high level of it. Yeah. Um, but like for right now, it's it's using SGX plus Shamir secret sharing. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to happy to talk to loop in my CTO and you know happy to kind of dive into the specifics of the MPC layout as well. Yeah, all good. Looking forward towards uh, decentralizing, you know, the the, the really network. Thank you for the uh, amazing demonstration. And remember to check the chat box reply uh, to some of the questions from our audiences. And uh, I'll move to the next project for, for now. Okay, awesome guys. Yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. And um, yeah, like feel free to reach out if you have any questions or anything, but um, yeah, this is, this is great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ez. Thanks, bye. Up next, we have Island. Mike, are you with us? Hey, hey, yeah, sure, I'm here. Perfect, let's get you started. Okay, I'm able to share the screen now, right? Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Ijov, and today I would like to present you um, Island. Uh, Island is the first uh, money markets protocol objective. So we're building the uh, lending and borrowing uh, infrastructure for capital efficiency inside uh, on top of the injective uh, protocol. In our first iteration, we in our first version of the product, we built simple um, we built simple uh, lending and borrowing um, product that allows uh, anyone to trade uh, to basically to deposit uh, three tokens and borrow uh, against these uh, tokens as the collateral. Um, in our test version, currently have uh, Injective, Ape and USDT, but in the uh, production version in the mainnet for sure will have much more tokens. So uh, the product is live uh, already. Today we're opening it uh, for public. We already have um, more than 100 uh, signups uh, or registrations for people who want to test it, but I'm sure that there will be much more. So the, uh, the liquidity protocol architecture uh, is described here. You can see it. So we're basically uh, 
doing something similar that we have in uh, other uh, EVM and other chains, uh, which is not so um, which is not so complicated. I can show you right now how the product works. So, um, so we're going here. Here is the here is our dashboard, uh, and this which is connected to the smart contracts in a test net. So let me connect the wallet. Are are, are you sharing the browser? I, I still see the PDF. Oh, sorry. I think um, I'm sure. Sorry. Yeah. So here it is. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's all good. Great, thank you. So uh, here is the here is the dashboard um, with the with the money markets, and uh, we connected the wallet, and now we can uh, we basically can deposit, and then borrow against our deposit. So for example, let me deposit USD. Oops, that's not the correct wallet. And, Okay, so yeah, now I think I can. Yeah, so for example, let's deposit 10,000 USDT. Okay, now we have 10,000 USDT on our balance, and we're able to, uh, we're able to. Uh, to borrow something. So before we're borrowing something, we need to um, allow this uh, to use this funds as a collateral. So currently it was uh, zero collateral balance. Now it's updated and we can borrow, for example, let's borrow some ING. Currently we have um, a we have much more than we can borrow in the pool, but let's borrow, for example, 500 ING. Okay, so now we have borrowed uh, and our balance updated. So here we have the user utilization ratio. Uh, we have user borrowed balance uh, and the liquidity in the uh, injective pool is lower because we borrowed 500 ING. Okay, let me do repay and withdraw my funds. So I want to repay all uh, because we're repaying immediately. We don't have any interest right now, but if we'll stay in this pool for, uh, for a couple of hours, we'll have the interest. And now I'm able to withdraw my, uh, redeem my USD. UDT balance. Okay, so uh, that's how it works. Uh, currently it's pretty simple. Uh, we're uh, at the following stage. Uh, the contracts are deployed in a test net, so we can um, well, we can check them in a test net. Uh, in the currently, we're passing the audits, so we expect to um, to launch just after we pass the audits uh, to the main net with this current version of the product, and. Uh, what are we going to do next? We have uh, we have some plans uh, for uh, for the coming future. So let me just uh, share some plans that we have. So first of all, we want to implement uh, flash loans uh, because we think that this will 
help uh, that will help market makers and uh, a lot of other um, users in the ecosystem to utilize the uh, lending and borrowing uh, protocol that's first and that's what we're working right now and we think that we'll um, we'll get the audit for the flash loans just after the um, main net launch and the second uh, the second thing we're working right now is um, uh, limit orders or limit positions to allow users um, deposit uh, USDT, for example, and uh, increase their leverage position. For example, if they want to uh, have a leverage position for ING with some um, um, with some margin, right? So that will allow users to have uh, increased leverage positions for the tokens that we'll have uh, inside the, in our pools. This is the second uh, iteration we want to launch with, but we expect that this will um this functionality will be in a several months so that's it what we have uh for now and uh, i'm ready to answer your questions hey thank you for the demonstration actually we have um two questions from eric the first one is is it possible to con accept open limit orders in directives or positions as collateral so currently uh, we don't have this functionality, uh, but that's something that will work uh, after we'll develop flash loans. Okay, um, yeah, there, there's another one, right? So is it a pooled model or is it isolated lending borrowing pair? So it's uh, currently isolated uh, lending and borrowing. Uh, so okay, excuse me. What do you mean by uh, what, what do you mean by the pool? So if I'm depositing multiple uh, tokens, uh, whether they're combined or isolated. Yeah. Right. So, so it's, it's, like, uh, it's uh -huh. pool model. So so you are uh, you are basically if you are going to um, moment, I will just show you. So, um, so for example, if I deposit ape, right? Um, let's deposit some ape. Here, uh, your um, collateral balance currently is zero, uh, but uh, let's make it available and let's deposit USDT. Okay, so first of all, uh, here's the uh, current uh, usual collateral balance. So now I'll deposit some USDT. Yeah, so it's increased. So uh, we're basically uh, uh, allow users to check which tokens um, he wants to be used as a collateral. And uh, you're basically borrowing against all, all, all tokens that are you enabled as the collateral. So if you want to, uh, if you don't want to risk uh, and just want to calculate, uh, get some uh, APY, stable APY, um, you just don't press it as a collateral and um, it, won't, it, it will be isolated. Got it. Thanks. Awesome. I think that's all the questions probably the team has for you right now. I appreciate the time to present uh, to present the progress you guys have. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, see you at our launch. Yes. Yeah, talk to you later. Next up, we have. Uh, Ilio firm Talis, who are going to present their groundbreaking works. Hey, Vivian. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us today. We are the team from Talis. I'm Elwa, the CEO and team lead. And with me is uh, Anthony, who's our lead dev and co-founder. 
Uh, they are not going to attend that call, but we count uh, 10 amazing and talented people in our team spread over the globe. Uh, we count uh, from engineers to marketing, from uh, finance to product. We got a pretty much comprehensive team right now. Our mission today uh, and here is to be at the core of the genesis of the, the NFT ecosystem. And uh, we are glad to, to introduce you to Talis, or we think unique solution. We believe that Talis is not uh, just an NFT marketplace. It's more of a platform designed with the community and the user as its heart. Uh, we've built it for quite some time now, thinking that the user should be at the, at the center of our consideration. Uh, as we said, it doesn't only uh, allow you to sell or put your NFT for auctions. Uh, we think it's more of a no-code laboratory with a next et extensive tool suit, sorry, for uh, pretty much anyone interested to dive into the non-fungible tokens. We got the marketplace, quite obviously, uh, which is going to allow you to, to trade, to buy, and to sell your NFTs, uh, either through direct sales, but also through um, English auctions. So basically the type of auctions that you will see on eBay. You can, of course, mint standalone NFTs. It's going to be absolutely free. You will just have to pay the gas fees. And as soon as you're flagged as a creator, as an artist, you're going to be able to mint your own collections and create literally thousands of tokens in a few clicks, but with uh, zero code knowledge. You will be able to perform snapshots, airdrops, et cetera, et cetera, and even migrate your existing collections to the latest standards. You can also create your NFT launchpad, which is going to be on-chain randomized and decide of its parameters as well with zero code. We are also offering peer-to-peer uh, -peer escrow in order to, to trade your coins on your NFT with a spe specific individual or a specific uh, address that you're going to choose and, and work with. As we said, we built Talis with uh, the user at its core. So one of our primary features is a 3% transaction fee that is collected by the marketplace contract and which is not just a fee, but also an, an opportunity for those that are involving themselves in the protocol's life. The fee is indeed then uh, redistributed to the Talis token stakers on Injective, which creates an ecosystem where active users benefit directly from the platform success and from their invo involvement. We think that, that that approach is pretty unique and it sets us apart from the other NFT marketplace that we can see. It's a model that gives back the, the, the power to the users and that encourages the, the active participation uh, of the users, as we said. We think that uh, as studies keep growing, we are aiming to, to provide a sustainable, positive contribution to the injective ecosystem. Uh, we want to become a part of its growth and of its de development, sorry. We are not going to be able to show you in our live demo the, the totality of the protocol and the action because it's going to take way too much time, but we would like to present you the first mean that you will be able to, to uh, perform on uh, Talis as soon as we publicly launch, which is pretty simple. Let me share my screen, please. So this is a video that has been recorded quite some time ago. Or UX and UI uh, evolved even from there, and we got a new logo that we will be happy to share quite soon, but we're going to show you the, the creation of your NFT. So as soon as you registered, as soon as you created your account, you're going to create your NFT, select the standalone token, and pretty simply, you're going to select the art piece that you want to put in. You're going to choose a title and a description. There you can put pretty much everything you want, and those will be recorded into the metadata. From there, you choose the category you want to record your NFT in. Those are for database uh, purposes. The key and values are going to be the traits of your NFTs. Those are going to be on-chain. You can add some, you can delete some. You can create them also with a CSV for, for mass upload, but we will come to that in a further tutorial. 
the tags are for database purposes uh, also and for classification of your nfts on the on the marketplace there you're going to choose if you want to sell your nft or not yet we are going to choose not yet and we're going to create a portfolio because this is the first time that we are minting on Talis. Pretty simple. You create your generic collection. Once we got the response from the blockchain, we're going to go through the next step. To make sure that you selected the good portfolio. And then you get to the royalties. It is something that's quite unique on Talis. The NFT that you create got uh, royalties that are embedded into the NFT. And you can create multiple royalties. Right there, we'll choose 5%. And we're going to create that, the, that token in the collection that we created before. And We uploaded the document to IPFS. We are now uploading the met metadata to IPFS. Broadcasting the transaction in order to mint the token. We can see it holds the royalties in into it. Once we approve the transaction, we just have to wait for the response to come. And right away, we will be prompted to our token page. So there you go. This is your token. After that, you can pretty much do everything you want with it, whether you want to sell it, to send it to anyone, burn it for it to disappear, or order at work. But we will come to that as well in uh, another tutorial. Or, as you can see, our platform targets the NFT enthusiast, the, the creator, the artist, the collectors, the traders, but it also provides a space for them to interact, to trade, and as we said before, to benefit from the, the platform's growth. So far, the scope of NFTs has been uh, focused on art and profile pictures, but we do believe that this is just the beginning and that in the end, the tokenization of financial assets, the financial basically the financialization of nfts will become a big part of the web3 economy as we said our business model is as unique as our platform it focuses on redistribution of the transaction fees uh, to the token holders it does not only create a sustain sustainable sorry revenue for uh, for the users but also provide uh, continuous rewards for the community members which makes them an integral part of our success even though we're in the early stage, we do think that we caught the intention of esteemed investors. Uh, we are talking about Parafy or Arrington Capital, uh, Cosmo de Medici, to, 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 cite, to call some, to cite some. And it does validate our innovative approach in our mind. We also are in discussion with uh, creators and institutions for collaboration, uh, for some of the, the, the subject that we talk today and more, uh, which will further enhance our, our market presence. And while this is going to be pretty much it for today, we do have future plans. Uh, the, the development journey of, of Talis on Injective so far has been pretty smooth and it has allowed us to constantly, uh, consistently improve our UI or UX. Uh, and our immediate plans include deploying the governance module of Talis in order to enable a more decentralized decision-making process. We want to, uh, for the user to not only benefit from it, but decide where uh, the, the Talis path should lead. And we are preparing for the public launch of our token as well, which uh, will be a significant milestone both for us and the community. Beyond that, we got uh, quite a robust roadmap uh, for the future announcement and features. We want to focus on uh, updating and improving the platform quite obviously, uh, but we also want to introduce new functionalities that brings more value to the users. Uh, 
for example, the, the NFT template, <coughs> sorry, designed for specific assets or the, the IBC capabilities that we can leverage as well, thanks to, thanks to the Cosmos, I guess, wasn't. And we are looking forward to, to growing with the injective community. We, if anyone got a project uh, relative to, to NFT, we encourage them and invite them to join us and to contact us in order to, to work together on that. If you'd like to ask any question, please feel free to. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I saw mainly right now, this is, I guess, for CW721 based NFTs. I, I wonder if you guys have looked into um, the native Cosmos SDK NFT module and if that's like, you know, within your considerations or plans to integrate. Anthony, is this something that you would like to, to jump on? Seems like we can't hear you, Anthony. I see that you're not mute, but... Uh... Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we do. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I was saying that's something that we, that we experienced experiment with uh, during the game of nft uh, testnet um I'm, I'm still not sure how much of a priority it is uh, versus all the the other things uh, we we have in mind so yeah all right um and I guess my next question, is there an equivalent of the like uh, ERC-1155 here um, supported on Talos? No, 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 there the, are the, the, uh, only uh, 721, no 1155. We do think that they are super interesting for quite a lot of, uh, of application. Uh, we were talking about final, finalization. Uh, that could be it. We were thinking about the digitalization of asset that also can be a thing with, uh, let's say a bag of coin that you comprise into a CW1155. We can think of a lot of stuff like uh, even game fee assets that can be completely adapted for, for that. But since we didn't have so far the, the, the need for it, we did think about playing with it, but we didn't integrate it into our product uh, on production. Got it. Thanks. Thank you for the demonstration and answering the questions. Um, we'll leave the time to the rest projects we have here. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Next, Thanks for, welcome. Thank you for having us. Likewise. Next demonstration we have here is the team from Temporal Exchange. So you guys can um, get started and share your screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Baron with, and I have my co-founder here, Rohan, with me. We're from Temporal. Uh, so yeah, quick introduction. Before Temporal, I used to work with a firm in decentralized clinical trials in their markets division and moved on to Temporal soon after. Hi, Rohan here. I used to work at Guggenheim Investments in corporate credit before I got into uh, crypto and DeFi. And we have our CTO Ayush with us, who is uh, uh, the, he was the engineering lead at Constellation. Oh, uh, yep. So I think we'll just put up our deck here and get started on what we've got at Temporal. Right. Uh, so yeah. Today, we want to introduce Temporal, a solution that brings a novel DeFi primitive. Uh, for any financial ecosystem, you know, debt capital markets are the foundational infrastructure. And this is especially at the short end of the curve, the money market instruments. Uh, these tend to be the instruments on which yield curves are built and all financial instruments are priced. Now, this principle is as true for DeFi as it is for traditional finance. Unfortunately, in DeFi, this critical market determined yield curve is missing. And Temporal aims to unleash the full potential of DeFi by bringing this primitive here. Essentially with it, 
our users can enter into custom maturity lending and borrowing contracts at fixed rates or uh, variable rates. So these can be as short as overnight borrowing all the way to multiple months. And uh, they are completely priced by market forces. Now, what this also enables is an on lending of collateral, which creates a whole new credit creation cycle. We'll now walk you through the temporal mechanism. Temporal generalizes the order book by adding in a duration parameter. The key order matching principle is that uh, borrowers can match with lenders whose uh, duration is greater than or equal to the borrow duration. This uh, prevents liquidity from being fragmented because it accumulates the liquidity that sits ahead of the borrower's loan maturity. We are going to show you a, a demo of our order matching mechanism. As you can see here, we've initialized a preset order book with uh, the borrow side and the lend side. And we're now going to match the orders. Uh, if you look at the top left corner, the yield versus duration scatter chart is going to get populated. As you can see, the orders have uh, matched and this creates a real-time yield curve. As you can see the scatter chart. Uh, yeah, so I think there was an issue with seeing the demo part. Let me just, right. Sorry about that, but yeah. So essentially this is the demo that we want to uh, showcase. What we've done is we've initialized, as you know, Rohan mentioned, we've initialized an order book and the idea is to be able to match orders in such a way that it creates a yield curve naturally and by the market forces. And you'll see on the top left corner here that a natural market yield curve for this particular order book has been initiated. And uh, yep, now, as of now, as for our build, currently we're following the DYDX type model where we're trying to build all uh, majority of our modules, which is the modified order book, collateral on lending, settlements, and secondary marketplace as well. We're trying to build them off chain to ensure that the computation and everything is completely efficient before bringing it on chain. Uh, and that's what we have today. I think we're pretty much open to questions. Yep. Thanks, guys. So, so is this a fixed maturity uh, bond offering uh, where, oops, sorry, my bad. Yeah, where basically, um, you know, the, the maturity is sort of rotating rather than, you know, uh, created upon like a purchase. Yes, so it is a fixed maturity borrowing where the borrower specifies their maturity and uh, there's a fixed rate that uh, is determined by the yield curve, which is applicable for that borrow. Hi. Sorry, uh, does that help the question, help answer the question? I think there might be an audio issue here. Yep, yep. Okay, got it. Why did you choose to go the off-chain order book approach? Uh, building it off-chain made it easy for us to kind of get all of the uh, computations uh, to like just check that everything works perfectly because uh, it's a completely novel mechanism that doesn't exist yet. So we thought that it makes more sense to invest in uh, really, uh, you know, getting all the pieces together and uh, making those work right before we put them on chain. So then the matching um, is actually centralized then, right? Currently, this is uh, just a prototype that's meant for demonstration, but obviously as we bring it on chain, the, uh, the whole mechanism will be decentralized. Currently, what we demonstrated, however, is uh, technically centralized because it's an off-chain demo that we're running on our system. Got it, thanks. Okay, um, any other questions we'd be happy to answer. Is the, so, so is the bond or the agreement uh, created upon, you know, the purchase or is it um, 
or is it kind of like a period of like periodically on a, like a fixed time frame? So for example, if there's like a, you know, three week uh, duration bond, um, it, is the bond created upon the purchase uh, or basically, you know, purchasing on the order book or is it, um, you know, rotating? So basically you get to see like a three week bond that's expiring within 1.5 weeks um, that are, you know, being traded Right. So I think if I've understood your question correctly, uh, I'm going to try and answer it. The, um, the market mechanism that we just showed you is basically a primary market where uh, if someone wants to borrow for three weeks, then the, uh, the matching of that order would basically originate that loan so that the borrower now has a three-week loan outstanding and the lenders are now holding a three-week loan, which they can then probably sell on the secondary market. So yeah, it's a primary market that we just demonstrated. Gotcha. Awesome. Any further questions? Thank you for uh, taking the time answering the questions. And uh, that's a thorough demonstration. Looking forward to the future um, progress in, uh, at the project. Thanks. Now, we have the, yeah, thank you. Now we have the team from Black Panther here with us. So um, feel free to share your screen for uh, the presentation and get started. Hi, thanks, Vivian. Um, I'll be sharing my screen. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about Black Panther Finance, an innovative asset management protocol that is designed to help you achieve superior returns on your digital assets. We all know that there are certain challenges in DeFi today. Whether you're trying to auto-compound incentive rewards or sniping a, a token on a DEX, it is difficult to capture you manually without automation. And without proper trading models and data analysis, it becomes nearly impossible to make informed decisions in the market. Finally, building profitable trading bots is a challenging task. Not everyone has the technical skills or the time to develop such trading bots. As a solution, we decided to build intelligent vaults that help you achieve superior returns. Our platform is fully automated, allowing you to profit from new opportunities with just a click of a button and no coding required. We use data-driven models and sophisticated strategies to optimize yield. And above all, we offer a self-custody solution where you have full control over your funds, deposit or withdraw from our vaults anytime. In terms of our technology stacks, our contracts are built with Rust using Cosm Wasm and deployed on Injective's mainnet. Our front end was built using React and our back end API was developed using Python. These services and our blockchain nodes were hosted on Ubuntu servers. Our protocol is innovative and differs from the existing solutions in the market. Unlike typical U protocols that do auto compounding or simple rebalancing, we offer more active trading strategies, such as grid trading and trend following, which provides a new source of alpha for our users. By providing a solution for users to earn superior returns, we will attract new users and liquidity into the injective ecosystem. This will make the injective ecosystem more vibrant and generate fees, which will benefit injective stakers. The additional liquidity provided to DEXs on Injective, such as Helix and Extraport, will also minimize slippage and improve the user experience for traders. Now I'll walk you through a quick demo of our protocol. Do note that this is a demo and some of the data used is purely for illustration purposes. So first I'll click on the Connect Wallet 
button to connect my Kepler wallet. So after the wallet connects, um, the website will display my token balances in my wallet. I'll then go ahead to deposit funds into the vault. So as you can see, this will cause the Kepler window to pop up so that you can interact with our vault contracts, which are currently live on Injective Mainnet. To withdraw funds, you click on the withdraw button, enter the amount of tokens you wish to withdraw, and then proceed to withdraw funds from the vault. After the user deposits funds into our vaults, our trading bots, which are whitelisted, then manage your funds. Our bots will use your funds to run grid trading and trend following strategies. In addition, your funds will also be used to provide liquidity on DEXs, auto compound your incentive rewards to ensure that you earn maximum yield on your digital assets. On the top left-hand corner of the website, uh, we have the main candlestick chart which shows the prices of a trading pair and the real-time trades made by our bots. In this case, we are looking at the price of the injective USDT pair. Green arrows and red arrows displayed on the chart indicate buy and sell trades made by our bots. On the events table on the right, you can view the actions performed by our bots, such as doing buy or sell trades, providing liquidity or claiming rewards. These trade events are linked to the blockchain explorer so you can confirm that the trades were bro broadcasted to the blockchain. On the bottom left chart, you can view the performance and cumulative returns of our trading bots over time. Check out the current asset allocation and the top positions being held by our trading bots. Additionally, you can view key statistics of each vault, such as the profits, APY, and the assets being held in the vault. We offer a wide range of trading strategies across multiple DEXs and pairs. In addition, you can easily switch between different blockchains from the drop-down menu to view our vaults on multiple chains throughout the Cosmos ecosystem. Moving on to the dashboard page, we provide a dashboard for users to get an overview of all the vaults they have deposited funds in, a summary of the performance and key statistics of each vault. We also include a swap interface where users can easily purchase tokens to deposit into our vault. Our product leverages Injective's advantage as a DeFi hub with deep liquidity and sub-second block times, allowing us to run our trading strategies effectively with very low slippage. There are other successful examples in the market that validate our product, such as Beefy Finance and Yearn Finance, these yield protocols have shown that it is possible to achieve huge success and earn real revenue by offering intelligent asset management vaults as a service. Our target audience are retail investors, institutional investors, and DeFi enthusiasts seeking to grow their portfolios in DeFi markets through actively managed trading strategies. Moving on to our business model, we charge a 2% management fee per annum and a 1% withdrawal fee. Our goal is to have a total value locked of $1 billion by 2026, which will be 14% of Yearn's peak TVL. This will allow us to earn $20 million in management fees and $10 million in withdrawal fees annually. We have big plans for the future. We plan on expanding to multiple DEXs and chains, such as Cosmos and EVM chains. We will launch on both Injective and Terra, and we are in talks with multiple Cosmos chains with plans to deploy our protocol on many more chains in the future. 
We also plan to launch a new feature called Star Trader, which is a discretionary asset management platform where users will be able to deposit funds into our vaults to be managed by professional traders of their choice. We will also build our own incentivized order book decks and plan to launch our own token, which can be staked to earn real yield from our protocol's revenue. Currently, we are seeking to raise $5 million to finish the development of our product. The funds will be allocated as follows, 50% for the team, 40% for product development, and 10% for marketing. By Q2 2023, we plan to hire five new team members, and we aim to launch our beta by Q3 2023 and to bring in 100,000 new users in the first quarter of 2024. Finally, meet our team. Our team has two co-founders, myself, Reflection, who has experience building trading systems at a hedge fund, and my partner, MC, who is an IT specialist, IT consultant specializing in cloud solutions. You can find out more about our product from our website at blackpanther.fee, and you may, meet, you may reach out to us on Twitter or Telegram. Thank you for your time, and we hope you'll join us on this exciting journey. Thank you for the demonstration. Uh, we'll open the floor to uh, the Injective Labs team for the questions they have. Yeah, I, I had a question. I saw on your UI, you had an example of like a trend following strategy. I'm wondering if that logic is on-chain or off-chain. And if it's on-chain, like how? Um. So this strategy is uh, run by our off-chain bots. Um, however, on-chain, we do implement certain uh, constraints um, that the, the bots are able to, uh, that, that the bots will not be able to, uh, you, to overwrite. For example, um, position limits or trade limits so that, so for example, uh, any single trade cannot exceed a certain percentage of, of the portfolio size. So these are parameters which could be set uh, in our vault contracts uh, on-chain and, and uh, governed by a DAO uh, where, where people vote on, on, on the parameters that they wish to specify for, for the trading bots. Uh, but in terms of um, uh, running the actual bots, these, these are run by off-chain bots. Got it. Any other questions from Chris or Eric? Yeah, I I guess you use Yearn as an analogy, and um, Yearn, you know, had quite a, a complex system of primarily on-chain, uh, like logic and strategies. I, I'm wondering, do you guys plan to, you know, make that more of your dominant offering, or go more of the off-chain approach? Um, I would say we we use a hybrid of both approaches, um, using um on chain rules to manage like uh key parameters, um that for for the bots, um key risk parameters, uh just to ensure that the bot does not you know go crazy and and does like uh, really huge uh, trades that are outside the risk limit. Um, but in terms of executing um, the trades, pulling data for for the for the models to use, uh, these these are currently uh, being used by off-chain bots. Um, of course, potentially there could be new tools that uh, come forward to automate and decentralize this uh, uh, process, and eventually um, we could potentially move the bots on-chain. I think another thing is um, uh, some, of the, some of the key strategy you guys, you guys can also explore is um, kind of like a hedging tool that allows uh, you know you to deposit into you know different types of payments or any type of liquidity provisioning profiles, but at the same time preventing uh, impermanent loss by hedging on perpetuals on top of injection. 
I see, I see. Yeah, that's a really interesting suggestion. Um, we're, we're actually uh, speaking to them as well. So um, we'll, we'll uh, ask them about um, what, what, what their opinions are about this matter. Okay. And it's a, it's a vault structure, uh, like a pool model, where um, there's kind of like a whitelist of participants that uh, execute the strategy, um, or is it, uh, or does it still undergo a few sanity checks before that uh, execution is done? Um, only whitelisted bots are allowed to make make uh, trades. Um, so. Uh, initially, when the admin uh, instantiates the contract, the admin uh, wallet would have to specify which uh, wallets uh, are, are allowed to, to, to run the trades. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, uh, is there like sanity checks or any type of like security measures um, that validates uh, the execution to make sure that, you know, uh, let's say the admin uh, address is compromised and it makes, you know, very, very um, illogical trades. Uh, it'll still be blocked by the smart contract itself. Uh, so, so the smart contract will have risk parameters. So if they make really illogical trades, they'll be blocked and the, tra the transaction will fail. And uh, secondly, uh, if, if one of the uh, trading wallets get compromised. Uh, the admin wallet uh, will be able to blacklist uh, the trading wallet and then add a new uh, a new wallet that uh, will be replacing uh, the blacklisted wallet. Gotcha. Yeah, and the the admin wallet would should probably be a multi sig um, backed up by hardware wallets. Uh, just to ensure that it's, it won't get compromised. But uh, trading trading wallets are uh, at a higher risk because these are hot wallets and they, the seed will live on the server. So it's more exposed and uh, more vulnerable. So it's, it's quite important that we have these uh, risk measures in place to, to ensure that our users' funds are safe. Awesome. Thank you for answering the questions. And we are looking forward to um, the future step for the projects. Uh, I'll introduce the next demonstration project now. And thanks for joining us today. We've heard some incredible developments so far. And now welcome the Exotic Markets team. I'll um, give the uh, speaking rest to you guys and let you present the demo. Hello, can you hear me? Actually, uh, sounds to have some small issues. Hello. Hello. Is it working? I can hear both of you guys. Oh, okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, I would take it. Uh, I would take it. Sorry for that small issue. So, please let me share this kind of slides. Actually, so, yeah, I would like to introduce you. Uh, actually, exotic. So, um, that's something that we've started to build uh, for like a year or something ago. And uh, I think, like, I would like to first introduce the Exotic team. Wait, I guess I have some stuff like being shared. The Exotic team, exactly what we are building, why Exotic Market brings something new to, to the DeFi and to the year generation. We will also talk about the future development of Exotic, a demo, uh, because we are live on the, on the, on the platform uh, on the injective dead nest. So uh, please let me just introduce a little bit like uh, maybe the team. So actually the team is uh, built with like three partners. So uh, myself, 
uh, wait, there is an issue with it. Uh, I'm very sorry for it. It seems like it just goes on the timing. So yeah, I'm just going to share like this if it's okay. So I'm the founder of the team, Geoffrey. I've had like a very strong experience in traditional finance. So I've been working in a hedge fund in Hong Kong for eight years trading volatility. So volatility like uh, index and FX. And the two other partners are people that I've been working with like extensively on the previous years before building Exotics. So there is like Loic, which is on the call today, uh, which has a very strong experience in like uh, IT and uh, finance and how we can combine both together, right? And uh, Benjamin, which has been like uh, one of the key employees at Binance, which built a lot of stuff on DeFi, on uh, on cryptos and everything, and has a lot of experience there as well. So uh, we have the chance to have like uh, like three strong partners. We have been working together and have this strong experience. And then currently we have like two developers as well, uh, which are working on the smart contracts and also working on the full stack of the of the project as well. And um, yeah, so a little bit about uh, my experience. So I've been like working in traditional finance, like I've mentioned, and then I've seen like how people uh, work with like year generation in traditional finance, because I would say like for traditional bank and especially private bank, one of the questions that you get asked by clients is, okay, I'm ready to deposit some asset to you, be it like US dollar or whatsoever, but I want to generate yield to it. And then that's something that has been like very important for crypto as well. I think the first uh, part of DeFi and crypto has been like uh, DEX, I would say, especially on the DeFi side, has been DEX. How can I swap one token for an ISO one? And the other one has been like, how can I generate yield on my tokens? I'm ready to let you ownership of that token, but I don't want necessarily to take risk or I want to take some risk and I want to generate yield for it. And that's the question that we've tried to uh, answer with Exotic. And that's why I'm presenting you this project today. So let me go back a little bit on how uh, yield has been like uh, generated historically uh, in crypto. So at first, people generated yield with just token inflation. So let's say you get a token XYZ, and then you could stake it and then generate more XYZ of the token, right? But this came out of nowhere, right? It was just like kind of printing US dollar or printing money. And usually what it results is that let's say you get like 30% APY, but at the same time, the token lose the same money, right? So in terms of US dollar term, it's not sustainable, right? So that's why when we started to build Exotic, we said like, let's look at what is working in a, um, traditional finance that we can copy and bring and improve actually in uh, DeFi and then in crypto. So one of the key way to generate yield out of your asset in traditional finance is to give up some opportunities. Let's be honest, there's no free lunch. You cannot just get like zero risk, all the benefits and a high yield. It doesn't exist. Or then it's a scam, right? So we've copied like one of the models that is very popular in uh, private banking, which is like you sell an opportunity. So we call it like selling an option on your deposit. And then for this, you generate yield. And that's something that is sustainable in a way. Why? Because you give up something for yield. You cannot get both, right? So uh, how does it work actually? So in crypto right now, we have some protocols that use that techniques. We have Ribbon Finance, which is like the first project which has been um, creating this kind of uh, platform where you deposit your token, you sell an opportunity, so you sell an option, and then you get a yield. So the problem with this kind of platform, and that's why we developed Exotic to bring something new, is that actually there's very little customization and there's no risk level customization. So it means like you deposit, you accept the risk that is in the vault, and it generates X, Y, Z yield. But what about people, you know, some people would say, okay, I want to take more risk, but I want to generate more yield. Or some people would say, I have a longer time horizon. I'm ready to stake my cryptos for, let's say, three months, six months, but generate maybe more stable yield or more like agreed yield upon start of the product. So that's why we started Exotic. 
to offer like this kind of different risk level API uh, matrix that I'm gonna introduce when I do the demo. So I think it's very interesting to take an example. So let's say that I have some ING, right? I believe into the project, but my view for the next, let's say one month is that ING is not gonna get a big market rally. So I have different ways to generate yields out of it, right? I can stake it on the protocol uh, when it's offered. I can also decide to use like a platform like Exotic to generate yield out of it. So let's say, like I've mentioned, my view is that the token is not going to go massively up in the next one month. So actually, I can do this kind of things. I can decide, for example, to give up my upside on injective. Let's say like I said, okay, I do believe like injective is not going to reach 10 US dollar in 14 days and trade out of it. So how does it work? In this kind of options, it works at, let's say I define like two weeks, $10 as the target of injective in two weeks, I said, it's not going to be above that. So if in two weeks, injective is below 10 US dollar, I get back my full deposit in injective. Let's say I deposited 100 injective, I get back 100 injective and I get a yield. In that case, probably like 20 to 30% APY. Of course, it depends on market condition, et cetera, et cetera. It's just indicative, but this kind of the idea. This is a yield that you get back. So if you deposit 100, you will get back 100 something because of that yield getting created. And then let's say in the case I'm wrong, let's say that injective goes to $12. Good, but this wasn't my view, but I don't lose that much you know, in a way, because why? Because what will happen is that your deposit will be converted at a value of 10 US dollar. So if you deposited like, let's say 100 injective, you will get back, 1000 US dollar plus your yield. You would just lose like from 1000 to 1200, so the two dollars extra. But you generated your yield, right? So there is no free lunch. There is no way to generate like in a safe way 20%, 30% APY on injective without taking this kind of, I would say, like measured risk because the idea of uh, the platform of Exotic is to present you different risks to present you different opportunities. And thanks to the our assistant is to help you to choose like the type of products that matches you. So that's what we call an injective like sustainable yield because it's generated purely through like selling something to get a yield and with a customization. So it's up to you to decide the level of risk that you want to take. Let's say that on the previous example, you decided to go like to 12 or 14 US dollar. Of course, the yield will be lower, but your risk will be lower, right? And so it's up to you as well if you want to, to, to lock your funds for two weeks, for one month, for six months. But the idea behind is that you are in control of your asset and then the exotic platform make it easy for you to select the perfect risk maturity profiles that you need for, for generating yield. Exactly like what a private bank would do. A private bank will just talk to you and then would just ask you what's your time horizon for the investment, what's your risk level, et cetera, et cetera, except that private bank is not for everybody, right? But us, we want to democratize this and then to make it available to anybody. Even if you just have 100 US dollar or 100 injective, you can use Exotic. So that's the key way on how we generate a yield and a sustainable, sustainable yield, I think that's the most important word into it for our users of the platform. So I would like to talk a little bit more of uh, the next step for injective, uh, for exotic on injective before we go on the demo. So of course our goal is to move from testnet, which we are now to a uh, mainnet. So of course we still need to like improve a little bit like the platform, the smart contract, make sure there's everything working well, but we are getting there and then we are ready to, to be there, I think by this summer. So that's very exciting. On the other side, to, to get this kind of yield, we need people to take the other side of the trade, right? So there's no like AMM possible for options. This has been like a growl that people has been talking, can I do uh, AMM for options? Nothing works right now. So 
we need market makers to evaluate the opposite side of the trade and then take that thing side. So that's something we are working actively on with uh, partners of our projects and everything to offer the best yield possible to the platform. After, we are very like uh, into offering more products and customization. So what do I mean by it? It's that the products that I've just introduced you as what we call like vanilla options, which are the simpler way to generate yield by seeing optionality. But of course, the next step for us would be like to generate like more sophisticated product, more something that we see like in private banking, and then that we want to bring to DeFi. So it means like, let's say, put worst stuff, basket uh, with barriers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why? Because this allows more customization and more like risk management for users. So you can really tailor mate your risk, your maturity, the kind of assets that you want into your investment. All of this, of course, offered into a simple interface that we're working on. And finally, the last step, which is not live on testnet now, but it's coming in the coming weeks, is how to build custom vote for users. So actually, Ribbon Finance, which is the first protocol that can offer this kind of sustainable yield, but like I've mentioned, without, custom, without being able to customize your risk profile, with like joining the crowd, I would say in a way like... Um, us, we are working on a way to generate like custom votes. So what do I mean by custom vote is that every user would be able to build its own way to generate yield, like, and in a compounded way. That's why we like vote because it's like you define kind of what you want to do with your tokens, let's say your injective, your USDT, and you build your strategy out of it. And this strategy is yours. It's your vote is compounded. So means like the interests are reinvested, et cetera, et cetera. And then we are going to bring like some innovative things that we didn't see elsewhere. So it would be like some ways to kind of control your vote without controlling it. So let's say maybe some stop loss or some, you know, signals, et cetera, et cetera, that we allow you to, on a simple interface, I really insist we want to be simple, uh, build something that uh, matches your requirement in terms of risk, maturity, and tokens that you deposit. So I, I think the best way to, to illustrate this is to go on a demo. So for this, please let me actually go on the screen. So I'll make sure that I'm sharing the correct one. Okay, so this is actually the exotic interface right now. So uh, we are on the testnet injective. So we are also have Solana actually uh, built in as well, but we're very excited by when injective built. So that's why we're also coming to injective. Uh, here are some of our backers and some of our characteristics and everything. I think I would like to uh, first mention like our exotic assistant. That's something that is not live right now, but how will it work? So it's pretty simple. Actually, it's the same as what happens when you go to a private bank. We're going to ask you questions. We're going to ask you what kind of risk tolerance are you ready to take? What's your market view? Do you think the market is bullish? Do you think the market is bearish? What kind of time horizon do you have for your investment, et cetera? And then this will help us to pre-select products for you. So what do I mean by products? So let's say that now we go to a single page, a single product page. So we're offering two types of products. So a type which is called here upside, where we sell the upside opportunity. So currently on the injective and Cosmos token and a, an opportunity to sell the downside. So same injective and Cosmos token. So how does it work? Exactly as the examples that I've given, you first need to have a vision. And so that's where our assistant, which is gonna be live in the coming weeks, will help you to really pinpoint the products because it can be a little bit overwhelming, right? But it will help you. So let's say that currently I own some injective 
I'm still positive about injective, but I think like in the coming weeks, it's not going to be like massive move up. And I would like to generate some injective yield uh, sustainable. So as you can see, when you select like uh, the upside of injective, you will see that you get offered like here two products were on testnet, so we don't have so many yet, uh, but you have like a maturity of 14 days, a maturity of seven, uh, seven days, and then you have two types of risk. So really important, you can customize. So you say, okay, my time horizon is a little bit short. I would like to go on seven days, but I accept this kind of risk. I go to 35%. My time horizon is a bit longer. I go to this one. So let's go for the 14 days. Same example as the one that I gave. So here we get like um, a detailed view of like all the details of the product. We have here as well, like a simulation tool. We have like the maximum deposit, et cetera. So the, we're on testnet, so the maximum deposit is 100. We have some details about uh, by the value of injective right now. Uh, my balance, I believe. Yeah, available balance. This is my balance. I've connected the uh, Kepler's uh, Kepler wallet. And okay, I need to reopen this one. Here we have like a simulation tool. So what we can really see is that if injective doesn't go above one thirty percent at expiry, so in fourteen days. Then I get back my full deposit. So here you see 100 injective deposited. I get 193 as a yield on 14 days only, yeah, right? And then of course, as more as injective goes up, I will start to uh, lose in terms of injective deposit because it get converted at injective times 130% of the value. Like I've mentioned, unfortunately, there is no free lunch. But let's say like injective remains flat, I get 101 injective in 14 days, pay to your wallet. So how does it work? So let's say I'm gonna deposit five injective. So just have to select five, of course, confirm the transaction. The transaction goes through. Here yeah, we have it. I have the, the bar here that so blocks my view. And I've deposited in the, indeed five injectives. So the transaction got confirmed. We just get five injective deposited. So that's the way it works. And so, of course, we can look at like Cosmos, for example. Here we just offer like one product, 21 days, high yield. And on the downside, of course, we offer some project, some product. Vault is a functionality that I've mentioned that is coming very soon. So how to build your custom vault uh, to compound your, your yield generation. So you don't need to reinvest in product every 14 days. You build your vault, you select your rules, you select your risk limit, you select where you want to, to stop investing in the vault in a way. And then this will be like fully automatic. And then you're of course, able to go there and then to stop your vote to, to redeem your tokens or whatsoever. Here is a dashboard. So on the dashboard here, I can see like, indeed, I've invested like five ING into this product. Like I've mentioned, like uh, 14 days maturity. Here I have a current position that has been uh, created before the before this presentation and then on which I have uh, deposited like 10 USD. So this is a downside position. So of course on the platform, we can get access to the details. We can play with the simulators and everything. This is to, for you to follow up the positions. So we can see here that actually the maturity is seven days and then we still have like four days up to uh, maturity. And so what happens at maturity? We use Pyth Oracle to calculate like to 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 observe the spot of like in that case here it's an injective usdt product so to observe the spot of injective slash usdt and then we calculate the payout so in the case of the previous uh, examples that i gave if it's below 10 we just return you your full injective if it's not we convert it at 10 us dollar and then you get back uh, some of it most of it actually usually 
And then here we have like an expired position. So this was like an upside injective position. So I deposited two injective. This was like a very short product. Actually, if we look at it, it was just like a one day product, very short. So um, the product started on 15 May here. It ended on 16 May. And this generated like seven bips. But if you converted it APY on a, so on a yearly basis, this would be like around 20%. And of course, when the product is expired, you have the capacity like to redraw uh, your fund from the product and uh, to, to, to gain back as access to, to the asset, of course, and then to decide to, to reinvest. I think like there's something a little bit slow. Yeah, okay, getting approved. So the transaction went through. And the position is expired and then I should have gotten back the position. Of course, I've invested some, so I invested five and then got back to, so yeah. So that's currently what is available on testnet injective. Of course, this will come to mainnet as soon as we are confident that the smart contract is fully secured, security first. And vaults is something that we're working on. And I think if I could summarize it, it's a little bit like what we have built. It's a beginning, it's the first stage of the rocket, I would say. But the vault would be like the last stage, the stuff that we are really like use all the power we have from the single product to make it something very uh, strong, unit, easy to customize with a very easy interface. So the idea of exotic market which means like exotic structure products in a way is to offer like, I don't like to use that word because it's always a little bit taboo, but like private bank to everybody. You can start from 10 US dollar, one injective, et cetera, build your own custom yield solution and start to generate yield. That's where really the idea behind it. Okay, I think that's pretty all on the presentation and the demo. Uh, I would like, to first thanks the injective team for all the support that they have given us uh also for the chance to present uh, today like uh, exotic on injective and please do not hesitate if you have any question very happy to reply yeah i'm i'm curious about um what some of your vault offerings may look like so let's say that you're kind of a person that would like to generate yield on your USDT. And you have kind of like a um, non-bearish, non-bullish view. You think like market is going to be stable, which actually kind of has been the case for the last two months, right? Volatility has been like all time low in ETH and uh, BTC and most of the tokens. So the idea would be for you like to combine, let's say different products. So like, depositing USDT, but combining, so selling the downside opportunity. So taking the downside risk, I would say in the way, let's say on Injective, Cosmos, BTC, ETH, Solana, whatsoever you, you, you can select, right? And the idea behind is that this is a risk that you want to build, right? So you said, okay, me, um, I think like my stable vision is very strong on like, the Cosmos uh, and Injective environment and also Solana, I'm happy to combine these two products into a vault. The idea behind is that you, you know, the same principle of like, don't put your same, all the eggs into the same basket, right? So you can pick up a few different products and combine them into a vault that is yours. So you say, okay, I have a 30 month uh horizon for my investment i don't want to take too much risk and i would like to combine this kind of assets into it i build my own vault this is something that we didn't see on all the platform right if you go to ribbon finance which is ansys really great platform because it was the first one to offer this kind of yield but to us doesn't go like where we want to go so in terms of customization in terms of flexibility for users you would just okay sells a downside risk or sells a put for ETH and then you would just do it because that's one vote, right? But it's not customable. It's one week option. 
it's always the same option that is being sold. Here, no, you select what you want to sell. Got it. And um, yeah, I guess one idea that I had is that, um, well, you mentioned that this is, you know, selling volatility is one way to get sustainably yield um, as opposed to um, inflation. But I was wondering, like, suppose you could juice the yields by also having, let's say, vaults that are for long dated maturities, um, whatever funds that are in there, like, let's say it's, if it's INJ staking them, or conversely, um, using like staking derivatives as um, the main collateral, like instead of INJ, you could use like ST INJ. Like, have you considered that? Of course, of course, that's a very good point that you mentioned. And then, for example, like on Solana, we use like MSOL, Marinate Solana, for example. And then on Injective, we're going to use the same kind of situation where, of course, we stake for the duration of the vault. If the vault is just one day, it doesn't make much sense because of trading fees, uh, fees left and right. But on the long term, uh, on the long term kind of vault or product, of course, we're going to do this. So you get that extra juice. It's a, it's really a good point and I forgot to mention it, but thanks for raising it. All right. Yeah, it, it, looked, it looked great by the way. So great, great work. Thank yeah, you. Well, wonderful work. Awesome. Thanks. Glad to see. Thanks for sharing in the um, question parts. Uh, right now we have one more team joining us uh, to give the presentation. She is with us and he represents Lupax. Hi, Vivian. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, whenever Hi. you're ready, you can sh uh, share the screen and um, pull up the presentation. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, so um, for Lupax, we want to build the Web3 AI layer with a decentralized AI network. And uh, if we look at today's um, today's uh, Web3, um, there are uh, blockchains, the apps, uh, decentralized file system, etc. But uh, for decentralized AI network layer, um, it is still missing, even if there are so many AI tokens, um, because um, for the network, um, um, no one is uh, doing a real like Web3 AI layer yet. And in this way, we want to enable a data-driven DApp future uh, with the AI solutions. Um, so high level, like uh, for the network, uh, it can be decentralized uh, with validators to uh, support the AI model predictions. And in this way, we can support models for risk, fraud, and uh, even chat GPT. Um, so this is a high level uh, architecture for the network. Um, basically, the model staker and the data publisher, they can uh, stake their data or model for network rewards. And the network uh, has a set of um, signal contracts which um, pub which supports uh, supports uh, uh, supports like like say the AI predictions. Uh, Make make them uh, accessible on chain, and also the model contract for the interactions with uh, model stickers and some other uh, functionalities like the model hash etc on chain, and we can even mint the our models as NFTs. Um, so uh, for the use cases, um, first uh, definitely identity and social. We have launched a wallet. Uh, score API uh, on uh, Injective already, and also Web3 Chat, Chat GPT, which is uh, our current focus. And uh, for example, there are a lot of uh, game and NFT projects. Uh, they really care about uh, the NPC kind of uh, like chatbot experiences uh, for the game characters and the NFT, uh, for example, collections, etc. And also for injective, um, there are um, there are data that is uh, so unique to injective. For example, the natural language data, uh, like um, uh, like all the uh, projects uh, on injective, etc. And and also we will build AI agents for security and fraud, etc. Um, yeah. So this is um, 
a quick uh 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 quick uh quick uh slides about like uh the in user interface uh for example we can ask questions about injective and also have plugins uh, uh each plugin it can be a wallet it can be a dex and some some other dApps and users can interact with uh with uh, with the dApp uh through the chat experience um yeah that's pretty much uh about the uh high level uh, uh about the project and i can quickly uh show the our websites let me yeah so uh this is our home page and uh, basically we want to support all kinds of uh, data driven the app use cases and uh, for example for social and also personalized nfts we have been uh, discussing with different kind of nft marketplaces and um, also uh, identity system uh, like the wallet uh, wallet score and for for the team uh, we have um, uh, mainly a team of engineers about 10 engineers now um, for example for me I have been uh, in Uber Facebook before and this is our front end lead um, he has been in the web3 domain for three or four years already and before that uh, working uh, in different kind of web2 uh, big big and small companies uh, etc so um yeah so for the uh for the for the uh like for the this is more like uh for the for the team side and for the app uh we have a quick demo about the nft recommendation and also the chat um uh, so for for this chat is similar to the uh chat gpt uh ui and we are training the model with uh, injective. We have trained the model, retrain the model with injective, um, more like uh, descriptions and uh, and uh, the uh, natural language data. And for the transaction side, um, for example, for the injective transaction data, uh, that would, would need uh, a little bit more time. So that is the uh, current status of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, chat GPT support for injective. It's more like chat GPT for injective blockchain data, which includes, I say, more generic descriptions about uh, projects, et cetera, followed by um, uh, blockchain like transaction data. We can ask questions about, uh, about uh, the transaction trends on injective of uh, different uh, tokens and also uh integrations with uh, the apps uh, for the um for example we can we can do swap uh for swap for in that in that for usdc or usdt and then uh it will uh the, the chat gpt ui can can interact with uh, with i say the wallet and, and the dex uh, for such kind of operations yeah, that that's pretty much about the the project. Yeah, you I know, like, uh, oh, you got it. Yeah, I I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I think in in my opinion, um, it would be very useful if you can train this data, um, on, like one, injective documentation, including API documentation, as well as um, like source code, um, of injective. Uh, as well as other like Cosmos and contracts and have it be more of a developer resource. Um, I, I have two questions here. Um, your demo showed uh, chat GPT. Are you um, using just the, you know, like open AI GPT API or have you used other models like Llama or um, Mosaic that are open source and then trained separately on your own like select corpus of data? And second, like, yeah, what do you think about this developer uh, orientation or focus? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great question. So, uh, on the uh, on the data set to train on, 
Uh, for now, we mainly focus on, let's say, generic descriptions about uh, in data, but definitely, definitely, uh, the um for developer education, that's a that's a very useful. Like, uh, for example, the uh, developer tutorials and the Injato code base and also cause Cosmos contracts. And I think for ChatGPT, the from product perspective, it's more like for a developer and and the user education, and uh, especially for developers. And if we think about uh, the Cosmos contracts, uh, which is which are kind of different from UM, right? And uh, another uh, another direction is like um, for user education. Uh, not only I mean, user education includes not only uh, the um, the oh, what's what's in that? It's more. It's also more about user experience. Uh, how they can interact with the apps with a unified uh, interface. So uh, that that is uh, how. Chat, chat GPT plugins can be useful. Um, so uh, like uh, re, re, uh, about your question about the, the model behind the scene. So for now, uh, for this version, we retrain and fine tune the uh, OpenAI chat GPT model. Uh, but meanwhile, in parallel, we have another engineer working on the, uh, you know, there are a lot of open source uh, pre-trained pre -train model uh, on top of Llama. And uh, there are about, two or three, which have uh, comparable performance with OpenAI ChatGPT. So we are still um, uh, playing around with those models. We hope to uh, have our in-house model based on those open source uh, solutions so that we can have more flexibilities uh, to, uh, you know, for example, uh, train the models for injective code and find uh, have more parameters and uh, flexibilities uh, to tune the model for different kind of data sets. Uh, yeah, so uh, high level, uh, currently in the next, I say one or two weeks, we still rely on, rely on the OpenAI ChatGPT API for the model fine tuning. We just feed the data and tune the parameters. And, but uh, uh, I would say, I like, say after four or five weeks, we will have our own internal version. Yeah, good to hear. I, I think definitely one of the biggest hurdles um, for new developers is, well, on, on Injective for Cosmosm, well, you have to learn, first of all, Cosmosm, which is a you know higher learning curve than Solidity and EVM um, mm -hmm. because it also requires learning Rust. Um, I, I definitely think that um, having a code base, like a model that understands um, you know Cosmosm and may, maybe also even just Rust um, deeply, um, mm -hmm. As a general thing, just for the Cosm Cosmos ecosystem, is useful. And then having further customizations and training on like like Injective's code base can then even be a lot more powerful. Um, so yeah, I, I hope it's something that you consider. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. Uh, probably after that, we can uh, we can have a, a developer kind of uh, education support as our highest priority to improve the model. And um and step back like uh, other than developer education, I do think um, uh, for example like uh, from either user or uh, or investor perspective, I mean the token investors, uh, token buyers, like is it useful to analyze the transaction data and 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 support more kind of like say questions about uh, could you. Uh, could you show me uh, recent uh, transaction trends on on injectives? Uh, some like some question yeah. like, like that. Is, is that useful to you? Like, yeah. So I I think uh, that in, in my opinion it, it is useful, but it also seems harder since um there there are there are more stacks to this like data pipeline, right? Because you would first mm -hmm. kind of need a data warehouse of I, I think you mentioned indexed data, or you have some indexing going on which um, in itself is a bit non-trivial. And then basically I would assume you would need to convert like the user's query into some sort of like SQL like input or SQL command or some sort of query, which will then, you know, operate off this, um, you know, data warehouse and then translate that back into the user, right? So it, it seems like there's more more steps and more 
custom bespoke work to get this like business intelligence sort of function um, or like just investor or like, uh, you know, community member intelligence. Um, so I, I generally think it is useful. Um, otherwise, if, if you just want to go like the based off, you know, a corpus of natural language um, data, like, you know, our public facing materials, that's um, a bit more limited. Right, because um, you know, one they, they could either just kind of search that themselves, so you you're, you're making it just a little bit easier to access. Or mm -hmm. I I I I do feel like the the bigger value add um, is where like you know it, it's hard for someone to you know find like let's say learn like new concepts about programming or Rust or Cosmosm, and if your model has trained over you know like ten thousand plus code bases or something, right, that are related in this yeah. topic. As well as the injective code base, then it's like, yeah, you can provide answers that will be much harder to find. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that you know, once if you do have this like data engineering capability, um, what what you described uh, in terms of the I guess analytics or business intelligence is also useful. But it, it just mm -hmm. seems more more work for um, maybe less value, in my opinion. But yeah, that's that's just my opinion. Yeah, I see, I see. Got it. Got it. Then we we'll can. Focus on developer code and the documents as the next step. Um, yeah, for the uh for the data intelligence uh, uh side, uh, if we have any like say, uh, analytics companies, they they just focus on the analytics and dashboard is uh, et cetera. And for example, for doing analytics, us uh, I uh, one idea we were thinking is um to you know limit uh, the data processing work which is like dirty and also a lot of hard work and uh, time consuming they so we were thinking like uh, if any kind of analytics or dashboards already exists for uh, injective data and then we can just index those dashboards and uh, um, which should be either uh, to do uh, and also with chat gpt they can we uh, we can make it more automated and for people to search and find those uh, dashboards. Yeah, but as you said, it's lower priority probably for now. I see. So if something like, you know, BigQuery already existed, it's just making like an end user who's not technical be able to access that um, and through a, through, through a chat interface, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like a text to SQL, but uh, uh, like, for Dune, it's more like for developers, but for us, we can make the uh, user experience more like with the text and then show the relevant data and the dashboards, uh, diagrams, etc. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's um, pretty much. Another question is, uh, do you have any safety mechanisms to prevent you know, hallucination um, where you know the raw instruction is uh, being prepared as uh, transaction data, uh, or some form of a sanity check to make sure that um, basically the users are informed of uh, what, what they're about to do as recommended by the uh, AI. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think your question is more more about, like, say, um, for example, data pollution to the model, etc. Right, and um, because for the model itself, we uh, we basically control the model architecture, etc. But uh, to attack the model, uh, it's more about the uh, data quality and whether users, uh, uh, especially in the future, uh, we may open and uh, we we may have a user interface for users to in, uh, input the data, like say the prompts for ChatGPT, etc. Then we definitely need a a, a mechanism. Uh, to prevent, let's say, uh, the impact of fake data, etc. Yeah, on that, there are, there are, there are a lot of techniques already. Uh, uh, um, a lot of research work on that as well. So uh, one, for example, one easy way to do that is like uh, we can uh, we can do a distribution. Uh, uh, like for example, we can divide the data into different kind of buckets. Uh, given the the distribution, like for example, the questions about let's say one D app of Injata, and and then limit, uh, limit the number or or the impact of uh, data from one bucket, uh, to the model, 
and then most of the the fake or or, or wrong data impact should be uh, limited. But for now, we don't have that issue because we collect and clean all the data by ourselves. Gotcha. Cool, yeah. So any other questions? That's it for my end. Was, yeah, really cool. Cool, thank you, yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Hey. I yeah, really appreciate uh really amazed by like all the uh, really amazing presentations done by project here and i think you know i'm truly humbled and astounded by uh, all these amazing amazing ideas and you know the speed of iteration that all the builders managed to achieve um and yeah like i think this concludes the demo day and looking forward to you know seeing all these builders again and checking out their projects more in depth learning you know uh the specific implementations and everything and don't forget, you know, if you missed this uh, hackathon, there's also an upcoming, uh, you know, uh, partner hackathon such as the Delphi hackathon, uh, where you can also compete in. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And that's all for the demo day. Remember to follow Injective on Twitter and stay tuned. Bye, guys. <laughs>